Hi there, my name is Courtney Paya and I am a student at the University of British Columbia. I am in the Master of Fine Arts program and I'm studying creative writing. Within this concentration, I am working on children's literature and more specifically, young adult literature. One of my main interests is environmental literature and so for my thesis, I wanted to combine this field with creative writing and examine how climate change affects mental health and a fictional future for young adults. Creative writing and literature on climate change are of particular importance as the world becomes increasingly environmentally unstable. Recent studies by the American Psychological Association have posited that climate change induced disasters have a high potential for immediate and severe psychological trauma. Despite numerous environmental studies, the effects of climate change on mental health are a relatively new sphere. Indeed, as climate change can have an, a significant impact on mental health concerns, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and more, the increase of global warming presents a direct threat to the general population's mental well-being. White North, my thesis, will explore these themes amongst the backdrop of a speculative future where the world has faced a cataclysmic event in which global warming has destroyed nearly all of the world's frozen landscapes. Our protagonist will have to navigate this altered world along with the responsibility of caring for her mentally ill father, a victim of a new climate-induced mental illness, and her younger brother, who is too young to understand the devastation around him. Although there are works of fiction detailing climate change and mental health, few exist that deal with this topic for young readers. It is imperative that younger generations become aware of environmental trauma and the cumulative and interactive effects of climate change as well as the threat and perception of climate change that adversely impacts individual and societal mental health and well-being. Now I will read um, from the first chapter of my thesis, so here is White North. The world is dying, but I'm still alive. Or at least I think I am. Gray likes to pretend he's a ghost, and maybe we are. This doesn't feel like real life, not anymore. Maybe we're just specters, floating around the great north, shadows of what we used to be. Mom used to tell me things would get better and I believed her. What little girl doesn't believe the things their mother says? She would tuck me into bed, the smell of her soap floating around me as she brushed her nose against mine. Don't worry, love, the snow will come back. She was wrong. It didn't come back and now she's gone too. Gray asks about her sometimes, but he doesn't remember her, not like I do. He doesn't remember her dark hair, freckles, or the way she would get a line between her eyebrows when she was concentrating. He doesn't remember the way she danced or the sound of her laugh, but I find myself forgetting that one too. We have a few videos of her, but I can't play them very often. Our dad goes into a fit. I wish I could share more of her with Gray, but he doesn't understand. In his world, mom is a ghost, and that's all she's ever been. Now dad is a ghost too, a living ghost. Pri, Gray yells from the other room, his voice slowly rising, Priya! I drop my book and follow his voice, the pitch making my heart race. I hear the steady thump against my chest until it stops beating altogether when I enter the room. Gray stands against the wall, his face white as he stares at our father on the other side. I can tell he's afraid, but he hasn't left. His eyes flip between our father's face and the hands he has wrapped around Cricket's furry neck. Cricket whines and my eyes drop too. He's panting, clearly distressed, and fear wells up in my chest. He's been with us since Gray and I found him as a puppy. He's part of the family. Dad, I say, my voice calm despite the panic I feel. Why, why, why did Gray unlock his door? Please let Cricket go. Dad looks at me, his face drawn. There's traces of a beard because I haven't had the chance to shave him yet. I can't. He's going to hurt us. He's going to kill us. No, he's not, Gray yells, anger coloring his voice. Gray, I say quietly, go into the kitchen. I'll get Cricket. Gray looks at me, tears staining his cheeks. I'm not leaving. Tension fills my chest and I feel like I can't breathe. Dad, Cricket is a dog. He's nice, remember? No, don't you see? I saw him yesterday. He's not a dog. He's trying to trick us. Dad's voice picks up and his body begins to thrum with excitement. I'm gonna fix it, Priya. I'm gonna make sure no one hurts us again. Suddenly, Cricket lets out a shriek and Gray screams. 
The veins in Dad's neck bulge as he squeezes Cricket's neck, and I feel myself lunging forward. I push the full weight up again of my body into Dad, throwing us both against the bed. My shoulder bangs against the sharp angle of Dad's elbow, and the pain is instant. But I hear the scuttle of nails as Cricket escapes and runs out of the room. Why did you do that? Dad screams as he slides onto the floor, his hands curling to his face. I was just trying to help. I was just trying to help us. I try to block his voice out as I run into the next room and grab one of the tranquilizers. The needle feels heavy in my hand as I fill it. We don't have much left. Dad is still on the floor when I run back, his agony clear as he pulls at his hair. I see the sweat so soaking through his shirt and the dried blood on his fingers from where he's nearly chewed his nails off. Dad, it's okay, I soothe, but my voice breaks. This doesn't feel real. Dad, please. For a moment, I pray that he listens. I pray that he stops ripping out his hair and that he looks up at me. I pray that he hears my terror and acts like my dad again. I pray and I pray until I realize that prayers have never helped. I'm on my own. Thank you so much. I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your conference.